Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Have a couple people here with us today, but uh, hopefully more people watching us online. But uh, I believe that as a church, it's not about the building. And I've preached that ever since I began as a pastor. And this year, I finally had to back those words up <laughs> with action. Uh, but I'm, I'm grateful that we're able to use technology nowadays. Back 100 years ago, they, they would, you know, during the, the Spanish flu and all that, they weren't able to do online services or anything like that. So I'm grateful that uh, God has blessed us. And nowadays, we can do this online. But I wonder sometimes if the enemy tries to get in the way of that. Because uh, technology has its ups and downs, doesn't it? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But uh, that's just the way it is. Last Sunday, I gave a challenge to everyone, including myself, that we, we would try to be peacemakers this week. Uh, you, everybody try to be a peacemaker? I don't know if you have much interaction with others. Um, if you're not online, you, you probably don't have a whole lot if you stay at home most of the time. Or talk, maybe you talk on the phone with a couple people. But um, those of us that are online and and see all the debating about presidential candidates and and uh, masks and what else is there? All the arguing going on with that. Protesting. Oh, protesting and all the different um, arguing going on. I, I remember hearing years back that if you wanted to start a fight on, on Facebook or social media of some type, all you have to do is express your opinion. And whew, <coughs> Everybody will start attacking. <laughs> but uh, so I gave the challenge to try to be peacemakers this past week, and, and hopefully we all try to be peacemakers. Um, th there's quite a few discussions I saw this past week that I could have put in my two cents, but I didn't. Instead, I, uh, I uh, tried to show God's love. And hopefully we'll, we'll keep doing that. In today's day and age, we probably need a little less hate and a lot more of God's love. So I like to start off by saying, um, where, whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on your spiritual journey of faith, know that you are most welcome here to receive God's goodness, mercy, and love. And that's why we're here today, accepting and, and trying to love all people and offering you God's goodness, His mercy, and His love. The... Uh, Reading from Psalms today is out of Psalm 105. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make his deeds known to all people. Sing to God, sing praises to the Lord, dwell on all his wonderful works. Give praise to God's holy name. Let the hearts rejoice of all those seeking the Lord. Pursue the Lord and his strength, seek his face always. Remember the wondrous works he has done, all his marvelous works, and the justice he declared. God is good all the time to us, and uh, we can trust in him, we give thanks to him. Uh, whether we like it or not, 2020 is a year the Lord has made, and uh, there are things that we can rejoice and be glad in. We are here today to worship God, to uh, seek his face. To open up our hearts to Him and receive a, a fresh touch of Him. So let's start off singing about the blood. We're going to be doing uh, Revelation 12 in the sermon today. And then there it talks about defeating Satan by the blood of the Lamb. So I'd like to start off with number 250 in the hymnal. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb?
question I could ever ask. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Because uh, we need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb if we're going to have eternal life. We need to be born again. We need to be washed. We need to be clean. And uh, when that happens in our lives, the Holy Spirit changes us. The fire falls on us. And so we're, we're grateful. And I'd like to sing about that today, too. Number 294 in the hymnal. Uh, I never shall forget how the fire fell. And this is our testimony. This is our witness that the fire fell on us. We have the power of the Holy Spirit, the comforter in our lives. Let's do, uh, let's see here. Let's do verses 1, 2, and 4.
So that's coming up. We don't have a whole lot of announcements because we aren't able to uh, do as much. We we tend to try to do big things at least once a month. We had all sorts of uh, things that the uh, leadership team got together and discussed doing. We're going to do something special for Easter and a whole bunch of different things. And those all got set to the side, but that's okay. Because we can come up with our ideas and we can make up our plans, but it's God who should be the one ordering our days, who is setting the plans. And so if God doesn't want us to do those things, we won't do it. We'll allow him to lead. Sometimes uh, we get ahead of him. Sometimes we get behind him. And we're just called to walk beside him. Keep in step with Jesus. This time I'd like to take a moment to um, pray. I'd like us to pray for our country. Uh, We have whole bunch of politics going on. We have protests going on. We have a whole lot of arguing going on in the world. And uh, about every day, there's something on the news to get discouraged about in there. Uh, often more than once a day. Many times throughout the day, there's things that are on the news that we can get frustrated, that can steal our hope. So I'd like to take a moment to, to pray for our country. Dearly Father, I just first of all I want to thank you, God, for allowing us to live in a country that gives us the freedom to worship you. It is our hope, Lord, that that never changes. That our, one day our, our country won't take that right away from us. That we will always be able to worship you. But if, in case they do, there are places in the world where it is illegal to worship you, and the churches are still striving. They're still kind of thriving there. They're still worshiping you. They're still leading souls to you. So even under persecution, even if our country decided to take God out of everything and not allow us to worship you, we're going to keep on worshiping because we don't love our lives more than we love you. We love you above all things, and we put you first in all things. And and God, we just ask that you will get a hold of this country in some way. With all the hatred and the arguing and the finger pointing and all the sinfulness in our country. I pray, God, that you will break our hearts for what breaks you want. That we'll see people who are suffering, people who are hurting, and that will break our hearts. That we'll be more concerned about souls than we are about proving a point. We'll be more concerned about leading people to Jesus than we are about winning an argument. We'll be more concerned about heaven and, and the kingdom of God than we will about the kingdoms of man. That is the, the biggest message, I think, in, in Revelation, that it's about the kingdom of God overcoming the kingdom of Satan and the kingdoms of this world. And, and you will have this final word, God. You are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You have the first word, you will have the last. And this world cannot defeat you. The enemy, Satan, he has been defeated. And so, God, we just thank you that you are at work in our country. But too often our country doesn't allow you to do what what you could do if we just had faith, if we just surrendered it to you. So I pray, God, that you'll wake up the American church, that you will help us, Lord, to seek you and put you first and be more concerned about you than about anything else, that, Lord, we will seek your face and we will honor you. Help us, Lord, to have faith to step out, faith to put you first. And even if it looks like it's an impossibility, help us, Lord, to believe that all things are possible with God. As the name of Jesus, amen. The, the gospel reading for today comes out of Matthew 14. And it says in verse 22, it says, Right then, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowds. When he sent them away, he went up onto a mountain by himself to pray. And that was something he did quite often. And uh, he's our example. We should be praying quite often, too. 
Evening came and he was alone. Meanwhile, the boat fighting the boat fighting a strong headwind was being battered by the waves and was already far away from land. Very early in the morning, he came to his disciples walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. They were so frightened, they screamed. Jesus spoke to them, Be encouraged, it's me, don't be afraid. Peter replied, Lord, if it's you, order me to come out to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. Then Peter got out of the boat and was walking on the water toward Jesus. But when Peter saw the strong wind, he became frightened. As he began to sink, he shouted, Lord, rescue me. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him, saying, You man of weak faith, why did you begin to have doubts? When they got into the boat, the wind settled down. Then those in the boat worshipped Jesus and said, You must be God's son. There's a lot we could unpack and preach out of that passage. That's a whole, probably a couple of sermons in itself. But that's encouraging to us as we feel like we're batted around, batted around on the waves. And this world has been beaten up on us some, right? God is able to reach us. In spite of the storm, in spite of where we're at, God is still able to reach us. And we just need to have faith. If we have faith, we can walk on water. If we have faith, God can tell us to do to uh, tell to a mountain, jump, and it'll jump. God can tell us to do all sorts of things, and if we have faith, we can step out. So uh, God's not finished with you yet. You're here, you have breath in your lungs, you are living, God's not done with you yet. There's something you can do for God. He just needs to uh, listen, because he, uh, he is more than willing to walk out on the water to reach you. All right, so let's uh, sing about how the Holy Spirit is our comforter. That's number 275. And uh, the Holy Spirit, that's the word comforter is used for him and been on the Bible translation. That's the idea that the Holy Spirit directs us. We don't know what to do. He shows us. When, when we feel overwhelmed, he's with us and we can trust him. He's, he's the comforter.
wondered if uh, the reason why I'm up here singing is for God to keep me humble. Because I'm not a singer. And I was very self-conscious of that, wishing we could get a really good singer in our church up here. And not just one that knows how to sing, one that's spirit-filled, spirit-anointed, able to lead us before the throne of God. Uh, but I'm, I'm what you're stuck with. And I've been really self-conscious of that. But this past week, uh, we've been watching Joel while Gail's out of town. And he watches TikTok. And he's been playing those videos. I'm like, you know what? I don't have to sing that well to compete with some of those songs I'm hearing on TikTok. Because uh, <laughs> there, there's a number of those videos that are pretty popular. And I don't sing any worse than that. I don't think. <laughs> so, I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> So thank you for uh, worshiping with me anyway, even though I know I'm not the, the best singer. I've always said that I'm uh, a prison singer. I'm always behind a few bars and can't find the key. So that's that's my, singing is not my spiritual gift, but um, I just, I enjoy worshiping God. I love worshiping God and entering into his presence. And uh, we just, we need to have that, that, life-changing encounter with God. And I, I've said, ever since I became a pastor uh, and, and read up, I was preaching there, and I would say often that the sermon isn't the most important part. It's the worship and prayer. Because if the worship and prayer isn't genuine, the preacher can get up and preach till he's blue in the face. But if we didn't open up the pathways for the Holy Spirit... You're just listening to a guy talk. We need to open ourselves up to the presence of God. We need to open ourselves up to the power, the fire of the Holy Spirit in our church, right? So I pray that all of us have opened ourselves up this morning to receive what God would have for us. Uh, as I said before, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 12. Uh, we did the first part last Sunday. We're going to the next part today. Wait and see what we do next Sunday. I've, I've seen that a lot of churches are doing uh, sermon series and stuff on Revelation right now. With everything going on in the world today, I'm not exactly surprised. But uh, I think there's a lot of, of messages in here in God's Word that uh, can speak to us. A lot of different ways we can understand Revelation. And I think that as we discuss what Revelation could possibly mean, I think it's important for us to remember being a peacekeeper. Because uh, I grew up in environments where there was only one way to understand Revelation. And I didn't understand Revelation that way. So I was at Bible college in a denomination that said you had to be pre-trib only. And I'm like, God, what am I doing here? I'm not... I don't fit. My beliefs don't fit with this. And so I can, I'm, I'm in the Nazarene church now. I'm not in that denomination anymore. <laughs> so God, God has a way of, of uh, leading and guiding us. Right? I was talking before about bad news. There's some bad news I read yesterday and read some more today. Uh, there's this gentleman, um, Jerry Caldwell Jr. Have you guys heard about this? He's uh, like the president of uh, Liberty University. And there's been a lot of controversy around him, and I'm not trying to pick on him to talk about a problem in the church today. Uh, there was a photograph that came out. It was, it was kind of, kind of the, the final straw. It just He posted it on his Instagram, but then once controversy started, people got upset. He took it down, but it's being shared anyway screenshots, and they can share pictures. Um, he's on a yacht with his family and friends and stuff, uh, having a party, and uh, this is, uh, I think, Liberty University, I think it's Southern Baptist, and uh, they have real strict rules about, you know, no drinking, you know, no uh, public displays of affection, you know, you know, typical Bible college rules. And he was in this picture, and uh, his wife's assistant was pregnant, and she had her, her shirt pulled up like this, and, and her short shorts unbuttoned, and he had his shirt pulled up, and his pants unbuttoned. You can see his underwear, and he's holding like, this flask with like, had alcohol in it. 
and just saying they said they were trying to be goofy. And of course, that blew up uh, <laughs> when a university has rules against that. And uh, they're trying to decide what to do. Well, I read that one student said that if a student had done that and not the president, and he kind of gets away with stuff because of his dad, Jerry Caldwell, who passed away in 2007. And um, they said if a student had done that, they'd be facing like $9,000 in fines from the college, plus their version of community service and for doing that kind of thing. So he's had a lot of controversy around him, his handling of COVID. He's uh, been heavily involved in politics. And so students have said that he has banned them from voicing a different view. He got in trouble for telling his students they should bring guns on the college campus. He said this, uh, I think, back in when was it, like, 2015, maybe. He said this uh, college, his college students should be able to bring guns on campus and shoot any Muslims that came. So, uh, you know, there's that. That got him in trouble. Um, there's been two dozen staff members that told a reporter how he would graphically describe his sex life with his wife. Just casually describe his sex life. And he has been accused of strong racist comments against black students. So, my point, and it sounds like I'm really tearing into this guy, this is all stuff that's out there in the news. And my problem is you have a college board of regents, you know, leadership in the college that has enabled him to do these things without repercussion. That's what I think bothers me the most, is that all these things have happened over the years, and this might be the one that uh, breaks, you know, the last straw that breaks the camel's back, but something should have been done earlier, right? This should have been nipped in the bud. And uh, he, in an interview yesterday, he said, well, I'll try to be a good boy now. Well, <laughs> that's a little late. You're in a leadership position in, in, um, in a Christian university. But sometimes we allow people with power to get away with things. And this has been a problem in the church for a long time. For people in leadership, pastors, uh, people in in above that district or, or worldwide, leadership positions aren't living holy lives, but then they're enabled to live that way. And I believe that we as Christians are called to holiness first. And if ever gets to the point where we're enabled to live ungodly lives and still have positions of authority, then something's wrong. I would expect the church to hold me to a higher accountability because I'm a pastor. I might not get everything right. I know I'll probably get to heaven and have to eat crow pie for some of the stuff I've said while I was preaching. <laughs> I thought maybe it wasn't as right as I thought it was, maybe. Uh, and I haven't always said everything right. I haven't always done anything right, but I would hope that I would show Jesus Christ to people. And I would show them God's love. And that I would be a witness for God. And that was bothering me as I was studying this passage. And it says one of the things that we defeat Satan with is our witness, our testimony. And these kinds of things, and I'm getting ahead of my notes from where I'm supposed to be right now. I was planning on preaching on this in a little bit. Uh, Satan wants to destroy our witness. And a while back I was asked, should Christians swear? Should Christians cuss? And I went over some different scriptures that talk about our witness. Would using certain language hurt our witness? Would acting a certain way hurt our witness? Then we probably shouldn't be doing it. Because we should be living lives that show Jesus Christ. And I don't think it's a matter of, like, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. You know, otherwise it's rules, and who cares about rules? Ever since I was a kid, I've heard people say the rules were made to be broken. But if we do things because we love God, and we want to live for Him, we want to be holy, we want to be representatives of Jesus Christ, that will change the way we live. Anyway, so I wasn't really trying to pick on him, Jerry Paul Jr., but 
to express my frustration at a church that enables people to live that way without accountability. We need to reflect Jesus. Eternity is forever. And if we live in such a way that we are rescuing souls from the pits of hell, then we're doing something wrong. We are in a supernatural war. We see in Revelation 12 this battle in heaven between God and, and Satan. We are in a supernatural war, but we keep shooting ourselves in the foot by not pursuing holiness, by not living for Jesus and taking that responsibility seriously. So let's look at Revelation 12. Let's start in verse 7. Then there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. But they did not prevail. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. So the great dragon was thrown down. The old saint who was called the devil and the Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, was thrown down to earth. And his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. The accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them day and night before our God has been thrown down. They gained the victory over him on account of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their witness. Love for their own lives didn't make them afraid to die. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but owe the horror for the earth and sea. The devil has come down to you with great rage, for he knows that he only has a short time. So who is this dragon? Rather, I want to look at some things uh, about how he's described. We know this is Satan. We know he's the old snake, which would be, uh, you know, Satan tempting Adam and Eve. Now, I often hear guys say, well, it's Eve's fault, but it says Adam was right there. She didn't have to go off looking for him. He was right there. And if you look later in Scripture, the, the sin isn't said, well, Eve, because of Eve's sin. No, it says because of Adam's sin. Adam is accountable. Us guys, we can't pass the buck just because uh, <laughs> we want to be selfish and blame women. That, that doesn't work. God doesn't fall for it when we try to blame someone else, does he? We're all responsible for ourselves. But anyway, so we have the old snake. We have Satan. So I want to look at some different things that he's described as. And I want to look at some different things that uh, those who defeat the dragon are described as. So first we see Satan here, that great dragon. The first thing that pops out of me is that he is defeated in heaven and only has a short time. Now, Revelation has a way of kind of bending time. We see here a jump back to when, to when uh, Satan was defeated and kicked out of heaven. He was kicked down to earth. And then we also see him uh, jumping forward in time to when he is making war against the children of God, both before Jesus and after Jesus. And and Satan has been at war because he knows his time is short. And we might think, well, it's been a long time. You know, it's been 2,000 years since, since Jesus came. Well, if you... To us, that's a long time. But to God, that's a drop in a bucket. He's eternal. Time doesn't have the meaning it does to us. And Satan knows that his time is short. If you uh, corner an animal, it often fights more aggressively, doesn't it? And that's what we see Satan. He, he's cornered. He knows he's defeated. And he's fighting for all he's worth. He has declared war on God's people. But he has been defeated. He's been cast down to earth. His time is short. He's only allowed to throw his temper tantrum for so long. Before he receives his final judgment. His time is short. He has been defeated. That's something we can believe in. That's something we can hang our hat on. That's something we can hold to. Satan is defeated. He has no authority. He has no power here. When Satan comes along, we can tell him, you have no authority. 
I bind you, I, I defeat you in the name of Jesus. Depart from me, as Jesus said. We can tell Satan where to go and how to get there by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. So he's defeated, he's time short. Secondly, you see here that he is the deceiver of the whole world. Well, ain't that the truth? He is the deceiver of the whole world. He is a big liar. He has deceived the world to make the world. Let's look at America. How has he deceived America? Well, he has deceived many people to think, well, money will satisfy, or power will satisfy. And we have people chasing after money and power and fame, and then getting those things and still battling addictions and depression and hopelessness. Because they find that those things don't give the joy and peace that the deceiver told them that would. That old deceiver. I, I think of, uh, there's a line from a movie I like where it's talking about this guy, he has this, this bad guy after him. But the bad guy's more of an assassin type. And this preacher is talking to him and says, well, he's not going to come at you head on. He's going to sidle up to you. He's going to smile and act like your friend before he kills you. I thought, well, that's a pretty good description for Satan. When we expect him to attack us head on, but he's the deceiver. He's the one that sidles up to us. He's the one that smiles and acts like our friend but takes great joy in seeing the look of shock on our faces when he sees us, when we realize it's all been a lie. He is a great deceiver. He is the one who, who attacks from the side, who, who looks to hurt and maim and destroy and grind God's people into dust. And he is after us. And he accuses, he is the accuser of the saints. I believe that he will use the scandals of Christians to destroy our witness. And so I was talking about Jerry Falwell Jr. And, you know, I feel like I understand he's not perfect. He shouldn't be up on a pedestal. But the other thing that bothers me, like I said, is, is how he was enabled. And so the witness has been hurt because someone who wasn't quite spiritually in a place that he should have been was enabled to be in a leadership position. And so we shot ourselves in the foot with that. And now the deceiver who allowed, who worked that and made that happen is now able to accuse God's children. He's able to say, hey, look. Look at what happened there at that college, at university. Look at what happened. He is now going to go around on news outlets and online and, and different people and say, hey, you know, those Christians are fake. Just look at this. He's the accuser. He takes situations on like this. He loves it when God's people fall. He loves it when, when Christians mess up. Because he can go around and say, hey, look. God isn't real. Christianity isn't real. Look what they did. And, and that happens because we forget to live by grace. We forget to be humble. We forget to keep growing, and we become stagnant in our faith, and, and we aren't doing what we should do. We need to keep pressing on. We need to keep growing. Otherwise, we're given Satan an excuse to accuse us. He accuses not just leaders, but, but uh, Christians, you and me. He, he, every time we, we say something we shouldn't, or have a bad attitude, you know, do, lose our temper or do something we shouldn't have done. I can hear him saying, hey, hey God, look, look what you did there. <laughs> did you hear what he said, God? I'm just grateful we have someone sitting at the right hand of the Father making an intercession for us. Satan is an accuser. And he may accuse you he may accuse, use people to accuse you. 
But God sees our hearts. God knows. And God will not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. God cannot be tricked. He sees the truth. So the next question I have is, when we see who Satan is, well, who are the ones that defeat that dragon? In verse 11, it says that they gained the victory over him, the dragon, the old snake, Satan. They gained victory over him on account of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their witness. Love for their own lives didn't make them afraid to die. So first we see that they were washed in the blood of the Lamb. We are saved by grace through faith. And so we, we have to have this balance where we understand that it's by grace. We're called to holiness, but as we sang before, it's through the Comforter, through the Holy Spirit, through the fire that falls, not by us. And so we have to understand that it always starts with being washed in the blood. It always starts with God's part. He's the one that changes. He's the one that transforms. He is the one that gives us the ability to overcome and live for God. It's through his spirit, not by our strength, not by our power, but by the Holy Spirit that we have the power to live for Jesus. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We gain our victory over Satan by the blood of the Lamb. That's why when we pray and we tell Satan, depart, we tell Satan we have power over him, it's, it's through the blood of Jesus that we have power over the enemy. It's through believing in that blood, believing in Jesus Christ, believing in the power of God that gives us supernatural victory. It's by the blood of the Lamb. It says that they have a holy witness, the word of their witness, their testimony. We defeat Satan by our holy witness. What is your God story? Do you have a God story of how God changed your life? That's how you defeat Satan. Not the story of, well, I've gone to church my whole life. Uh, I give money in the offering. I uh, teach a Sunday school class, or I preach, or I do this, and I do that. Remember the story of the guy that prayed like that? Lord, I, I think I'm not like that tax collector over there. I give money to the church. I do all these great things for you, God. But the tax collector is over there beating his chest and, and praying to say, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve you, God. And Jesus says that it was the tax collector who went away forgiven. Attitude. His witness. He realized that he was a sinner. He realized that he was in need of grace and that he had a God story. God changed my life. God did this in my life. And that's our God story. Our story shouldn't be, as I was saying before, that should be like, well, I'm such a great Christian. Look at me in this position of leadership. Look at me and all the great things I've done for God. All our righteous works are like filthy works. Our God story is about what God and that's what people need to hear from us. Not, well, I go to church. Not, well, I, I put money in the offering, which is, you know, which is important. Um, what they need to hear from us is God changed me. God touched me. Oh, he touched me. And I will never be the same. So they defeated Satan by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their witness. And third, they loved God more than they loved their own lives. It says, love for their own lives didn't make them afraid to die. And I think that's kind of something that needs to be impressed on the American church when we have so many Christians that get upset when we're slightly inconvenienced, let alone being willing to die for God. Uh, many, many Christians here in America, we get slightly inconvenienced. We have, we have uh, traffic jams, and we're running late for work. We're like, oh God, how could this happen to me? Why did you let this happen? We get slightly inconvenienced, and, and we're questioning God. 
Whereas those who defeat Satan love God more than their own lives. They'd be willing to give everything for God. They'd be willing to be inconvenienced. They'd be willing to, to give everything they have, including their own lives, if it meant building the kingdom of heaven. Satan wants to do everything he can to tear the kingdom down. He wants to use stories of fallen church leaders, fallen Christians. He wants to use uh, stories in our lives of when we messed up. Rather than allowing the Holy Spirit to say, hey, share with that person over there what God has done. Our witness is not about what we have done. It's about what God has done. And being willing to share that, even if it costs us our own lives. So what's the big idea for today? That old snake is waging war. He lost in heaven. He was cast down. But now he's waging war against God's children. He's waging war against the church. So the big idea today is that the old sin is waging war. How can we defeat it? We can defeat him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and loving God more than everything else. What is your God story? Think about that for a moment. If you were to share your witness, share your God story, what would you say? How has God changed your life? What could you say about it? What could you share about that? Can you think back to before God and how you were living and how messed up it was? Could you share about how God transformed you and how God changed you? Could you do that? Is there something there? Is there something you can brag on God about? I think there's probably some people that would love to hear that. With as much unrest in the world today. People need to hear stories of how we found peace. How we found joy. How we found hope in Christ. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. You have given us the authority to defeat Satan by the blood of the Lamb, by what you've done in our lives, by the Holy Spirit. You've given us everything we need win the victory. And God, help us to live in that authority, live in that power. Help us, God, to stand firm in you. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You are greater, you are stronger, you are more powerful, and no matter what Satan does, you cannot be defeated. So we thank you, God. We praise you and worship you. Send your spirit on us this week. Help us, Lord, to share our story with others. Allow the Holy Spirit to direct us Help us to hear your voice whisper to us and say, hey, share with that person over there. They need my love. Help us to hear your voice, God. I ask in Jesus. Amen.